afternoon. To, for our update, we're going to be chatting about the impact that the coronavirus is having on your finances, what steps you can take to prepare with all of the uncertainty and anxiety that people are facing with all of the changes and just how life isn't normal right now. So we're here to just chat. And if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat below. We'll be answering them as we go. Um, but today I'm Courtney <laughs> every day. I'm Courtney Nagel. I'm the associate marketing manager for the NFCC and I'm joined by Bruce. He's our VP of marketing and our in-house credit and money management expert. How's it going today? I'm Bruce every day. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's going okay. Um, yeah. just, uh, interesting getting used to all the changes and, um, you know, for at the at the main office at NFCC, of course, we've gone to a more flexible remote work schedule, which is why you don't see the NFCC logo behind me. Instead, <laughs> you see a refrigerator and a microwave and a uh, toaster. So that's uh, I'm I'm sort of hunkering down at home, uh, following the guidance uh, that's been um, that's been shared by the local authorities, uh, by the CDC, the federal government. And just trying to stay in place. I'm stocked up, um, got the portable office, and trying yeah. to uh, get adjusted to this new routine. But I will say this: I don't know if the same has been true for you. It's um, I'm having to find times to step away and get fresh air and get outside and move around. Yeah. I, that part of my normal routine is gone because I usually walk to work and it takes about 45 minutes to walk from where I live to the office, uh, which is just over two miles. Um, and so that gives me most all of my steps for each day and I'm not getting them by staying here. So that's another piece that I'm having to try to fit into this whole new arrangement. Right. Yeah. It's a whole new schedule even i work from home all the time but not having to take my kids to school not having the same schedule has affected like my feeling like i need to get up and walk and move and leave the house at least for a little bit and spend some time outside is definitely there yeah even just for sanity not just for health reasons but just to get out right. yeah. yeah that's important so that's important but having kids at home i mean that's that's a big challenge while you're having to manage workflow and then you've got uh, kids and you know, they're, they're out of school. So they're looking, you need things to occupy their time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you've been doing lots of interviews and talking to the media. I know a big question that people are asking, like what is the first step that we sh they should be taking? And I know we touched on this a little bit last week about how they should be reaching out to their creditors. Can you talk a little bit about anything new or any more tips that you have for that? Yeah, I just want to emphasize something that I've been repeating throughout several different discussions with uh, with the news media and with others during the past week or so. And that's, that's basically uh, this, that you, if you, whether you have savings or not, communication is critical. So, you, you need to know what your creditors, what your mortgage mm -hmm. holder, what your auto lender, what your credit card companies, what they will do, what their special arrangements. Oh, where'd you go? Come on, just a second, you guys. All right, we'll give Bruce a minute to hop back in. There you are. Okay. All right. Sorry for <laughs> that momentary interruption. Now you get the NFCC logo above your head. Yeah, we switched. <laughs> it's a it's crazy. It's an amazing magic trick. 
I don't know where I was when I dropped off, uh, but I just, I guess I'll go back and start again. Whether you have savings or not, it's important for you to communicate with your creditors, your mortgage lender, your auto lender, your credit card company, and understand the options they have available for you if you're going to have difficulty making your payments and keeping your accounts up to date. There's been a lot of uh, discussion about how long this is going to last with the uh, impact of the coronavirus and how long people are going to be out of work, how long people are going to be working on reduced hours and what impact that's going to have on the overall economy. But if you don't have enough savings set aside to get you through a period of reduced income that extends more than a couple of weeks, uh, I think it's important right now to contact your creditors, to get in touch with them, to have a discussion, find out what programs are available and understand what impact those programs have on your credit health. Um, But knowing about what those programs are can help you understand how far you can stretch your dollars. Because if a creditor tells you that they'll let you skip a payment, uh, that's all, that's less money that you have to send to them and more that you can allocate to other necessities like food, uh, like medical care. Uh, if, if a creditor gives you an option to go on interest only payments for a period of six months, uh, that may not be, that may not be what you wanted, but it's better than nothing. And so you can at least know that you have a little bit of extra money that you can then reallocate to the important things there. So it's, that's why communication is critical up front. So when you know going into this exactly what accommodations that you may be able to take advantage of from the creditor side, that gives you a crystal clear picture of how far you can stretch whatever savings you have set aside. And even if you have no savings set aside, it helps you understand um, at least what you can do to prevent having to go through the worst possible scenario with the creditors and those that you owe. And utility companies, I would add to that discussion too, Utility providers are offering special uh, terms and special waivers. Uh, if you are about, if if you're about to get your uh, utilities cut off for non-payment, a lot of utility companies have already announced that they're not going to be turning off people's utilities during this crisis. So you can ass- be assured that even though you can't pay, your utilities are not going to get cut off. Uh, but that's on a utility company by utility company basis. So check to make sure what your utility company is offering and see what they can do for you. So I would say utility companies are also important. And if you're a renter, talk to your landlord, let them know what circumstances you're facing and what special arrangements you may need. And that's gonna be more of a direct case by case negotiation, uh, depending on your property management company, or if you're renting directly from a homeowner, you know, you're just gonna have to have a frank discussion and see what they can offer. Yeah, that can be, I'm sure that's gonna be harder for a lot of people, because I know rent renting is very popular these days for a lot of reasons. But yeah, so that's it. It puts it, it. It can put people in a difficult position because there may be their creditors may be flexible, their utility companies may be flexible, but you may be dealing with a situation where the landlord doesn't have a lot of flexibility to offer or isn't willing to. Right. Either situation isn't good for the renter. With People who are homeowners, if they if they reach out and talk to their mortgage company, I mean, they can have the same experience that they might have with uh, their credit card company, where there may be some options the mortgage lender can put in front of them in terms of making interest only payments for one or two months or skipping a payment altogether. Those uh, those are also viable options that mortgage lenders have used in other circumstances prior to this uh, to this coronavirus, this COVID-19 situation, and they have those tools at the ready. So if you're a homeowner, if you're a credit card borrower, your auto loan, you know, all those situations are, are somewhat pliable based on the different options that uh, the creditors are willing to extend. Right. One question that a friend of mine was asking, like, is it a good time for people to be buying homes because the rates have dropped so low? And mm. I know that I was like, I'm not sure. It kind of depends. There's a lot of uncertainty right now. And if you're in a situation where your income is, is a situation, your earning ability is in flux and you don't know week to week, month to month, what's going to be happening with your job. Um, you know, you're taking a bit of a risk. Uh, you could end up in a situation where you get qualified for the mortgage now based on what your income situation looks like in the moment, but then you could get, uh, you could you could 
get laid off or you could suffer significantly reduced hours after you close on the mortgage and move into the home that would put put you in a situation where you could go straight into default on a brand new mortgage. You know, it's it's a risky situation, but there is one thing for sure that mortgage rates are very low and there are a lot of good deals out there right now. And this could be turning things around for people who might have been struggling with the question about buying a home. But because so many other uncertainties are out there uh, that where this this crisis could be impacting people's bottom line, their household budget, you know, that's it's a tough call. It's going to have to be a case by case situation. But if you're working a job that has a steady income and you don't think you're going to be impacted as much by the current environment with the uh, with the coronavirus, you may want to go ahead and take a chance and see what's out there because you could save a lot of money. Um, and the same goes for people who are looking to refinance. Maybe now is the time to refinance and get a lower interest rate. So you might want to look at that as well. Okay. Um, the next question that we had was when should people switch to an emergency budget? Um, is that um, immediately or when like, I know some people don't know if their job is going to end up closing or not closing. I think it kind of depends on how the government moves forward and if there's stricter policies put in place for people to have to shut down even further. Yeah, and that's federal and local government because we know that there are major cities out there that have uh, that have taken steps towards total shutdown, uh, requiring people to stay in their homes, stay off the streets, those kind of things. We've mm -hmm. already seen that happening in other countries. It's possible it could happen here. Uh, but right now it's just on an employer by employer basis or a city by city basis as to what the response is and how it impacts uh, how it impacts companies. I will say this, I mean, in, in most cities that I know of, major cities, people who work in the restaurant industry, people who work in the travel industry, uh, these are, these are a lot of these are people who rely on. Sorry, you guys, we're working on home internet um, bandwidth and we've seen a lot there. I heard from one IT company that there's an over 130% more use being taken up because of all the people at home working from home, kids being at home, there's more devices and more strain on the Wi-Fi. So I think that's why Bruce, he's keeps getting kicked out. So he'll be back. All right, here you are again. Hey, I was just telling people about how we were talking about the bandwidth of the Wi-Fi in communities is being over overrun in some areas. Um, I don't All know. my neighbors need to stop watching Netflix while I'm trying to do this, right? <laughs> right. Some people need to work, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, so I guess what I'm the restaurant industry when you dropped. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of these are hourly wage earners. They may not have uh, sick leave benefits or paid time off, uh, so it's really hitting those individuals very hard already. Um, so they're already in need of switching to an emergency budget. And an emergency budget is essentially, and I've, I've talked about this a lot today with different people. There's there's a certain variety of budget that's highly recommended that you use on a regular basis. It's called the 50-30-20. 50% of your uh, income should be going to necessities, 30% to fun, uh, entertainment, uh, variable expenses, and then 20% should be going into your savings. It's a very simple way to keep track of your budget. In an emergency situation, you need to get rid of the 30 and the 20 and focus exclusively on the 50. That should be where all of your resources are allocated. So that's what your savings is for, because then you use that to supplement the income you're not getting and focus on that 50% of your budget which is your your food, your your shelter, your health care, um, utilities, those kind of things that keep you alive and keep you healthy and keep you going. Uh, everything else you need to either negotiate, get reduced terms, special terms, uh, or eliminate altogether uh, or postpone. Like gym memberships can be put on hiatus. Yeah. And even streaming services, you can pause those. Uh, for a period of time where you don't have to pay for those streaming services. Like all my neighbors right now that are watching Netflix <laughs> market bandwidth, maybe they might benefit from that information. So those are some of the things that you need to do when you're switching over to an emergency budget. But if you're in, in any of those industries and you know that even if you haven't already been impacted, that some reductions in work hours are coming, 
it's probably a good idea to start thinking about having that emergency budget ready and switching over to it in a proactive way uh, so that you can start cutting back on the things that you that are that aren't necessities that you don't need to spend on. Right. It can be tough giving up Netflix and other streaming things right now, especially when you're stuck inside and you have nothing to do. But it's yeah. definitely it, one of those things that isn't necessary. Yeah, and, and even internet service uh, as well. If it's not necessary and you already mm -hmm. have a mobile device, a lot of the mobile phone providers, a lot of the mobile service providers are actually giving free additional bandwidth to, the, to their subscribers. Mm -hmm. So you, it could give you the leverage you need to go ahead and cut internet uh, and, and cable at mm -hmm. home and just use the mobile device that you have. And that, that can save you a lot of money right yeah. away. Yeah. What should people do if they don't have any savings? Yeah, that's a tough one. And there are so many people that don't have savings. 40% uh, of Americans don't have enough to cover uh, a $400 expense, uh, unexpected emergency expense. So there are people that either have very little savings and it's basically meaningless when you go into a situation where you're going to be off work for weeks uh, or they have no savings at all. Uh, that's when you really need to start cutting back immediately on the things that you're spending on the things that you're spending on and start cutting those discretionary entertainment expenses to free up any available cash in your budget to start putting aside so you'll have that money available. Uh, it's not, it, it is never too late. As long as you're earning income, it is never too late to start savings. Uh, but when you stop earning income altogether, obviously you can't and you need to rely on some of the resources that are available in your community to help you get by. That's where the food bank comes in. That's where utility assistance comes in. That's where all of these other programs can help you get through a very difficult time when you don't have any savings. You can also start thinking about selling some of the items that you don't necessarily need. Um, in this environment, it could be tough depending on what you're trying to sell uh, to find a buyer, but there, there's always a need out there. And if you have something that can be useful to somebody and that you're not using it right now and it has cash value, that can help you get a quick, uh, a, a quick stream of cash flow into your savings that you wouldn't otherwise have. Right. I know that there's a lot of legislation being passed for unemployment and those types of things. Do you know anything about how people can go about that process? Yeah, I don't have all the details in front of me in terms of special uh, unemployment programs, but I do know this, that if you are if you need to make a quick pivot and you're in a service industry job, and the, the jobs that I mentioned earlier, uh, service industry jobs, food industry, entertainment industry, travel industry, there are others that are out there that are experiencing high demand for their services and they don't have enough staff. They're looking to hire right now. Yeah. So you can look around for those. In fact, Amazon just announced that it's going to have to hire. I couldn't believe the figure when I saw it, but I thought it, they said 100,000 people yeah, that's that what I thought. for delivery drivers, for you know people to work in their supply warehouses and things like that during the time of crisis. That's 100,000 jobs that are out there waiting to be filled. So yeah. not only can you utilize some of the uh, some of the modified benefits that could be available through your uh, through your state and local unemployment agencies, but also uh, you can be out there trying to find some of these industries that are looking to hire to cover increased demand. So there are opportunities out there. So it's all, it goes back to the old saying, when one door closes, another one opens. Uh, that's exactly the mindset you should be in if you've been affected and you should start looking about ways to generate the cash flow. And you can also rely on the gig economy too. Those jobs are still out there uh, and there may be a need to be filled uh, in your community. You just need to kind of look around and check out and see what's available. Yeah. Um, it's definitely important to be flexible. <laughs> mm -hmm. Be jumping into something not really, like if I had to go get a job driving an Amazon truck, I'd be like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but I think there's just a great- I'm sure you're a good driver. Flexibility. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I would agree with that, but I don't know about a big truck. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, yeah, that's, that's a, but the little, um, little Amazon trucks, I could probably manage that. Right. Um, is there any other topics? I know you're touching on tons of topics that I don't have questions written for, but what you're um, through with reporters or tips you have? Well, another thing I want to bring up, and this is really important because the advice that I'm giving some people might th think, well, that's great. You know, it's nice. You're saying talk to my creditors, uh, but I can't get through. And that is a reality that a lot of people are facing. Phone lines are jammed. 
I had to cancel a flight the other week and I sat on the phone for two hours just to talk to somebody. The website was not helpful at all and there was no way to get the results I needed. So I had to jump on the phone. One thing I would advise people to do is, you know, it's not that we're giving out some of this advice about call your creditor and talk to them and have a nice fun discussion without understanding the reality of what that is going to involve because, you know, some of us have been through that too. We've had to wait long hours on hold just to talk to people. We've had to call back again. We'd have to request callbacks. It's not quick and easy and there are going to be frustrations. And I think the best thing to keep in mind is just to be patient during this whole process because there are millions of other people who are in the same situation that you're in right now. And chances are the person that you'll be talking to, the customer service agent that you'll be talking to has the same concerns as having to deal with the same things that you're having to deal with when they're off the clock. So right. I think if you approach those conversations with that perspective, it makes it a little easier, but sure, it's no fun to have to wait through two hours of, you know, holding on the, on the phone and listening to excruciatingly bad music uh, played mm -hmm. through a tinny speaker um, to get the, the results you want and to not even get them maybe on the first try, but be patient, be persistent, and be honest and open about your circumstances too. Uh, don't exaggerate and don't underplay your circumstances either. Just tell things like they are. But you also need to be open to the questions that you might be asked during these conversations because in order to help you, your creditors and your utility providers are going to want to know specifics as much as you can provide about your cash flow situation and about uh, your income and what requirements you have other than their account. And one thing that I'll point out that might not be realized by a lot of people, when you're talking to your credit card company and you're having these conversations, the last time you gave them a full accounting of all of your finances and your obligations was when you applied for the account. Right. That could have been 10 years ago. So the person you're speaking with does not have a clear picture of where you are in the moment. So that's another area where you have to be patient and understand that they don't have up to the minute information that shows them what you're dealing with. Um, and I think if you understand that perspective and you allow a little bit of patience on your side, they'll be patient with you as well. And I think you can arrive at some, uh, at a pretty good outcome if, if you approach it that way. Yeah. I have seen some messages from creditors that are saying use your secure messaging in your online account. Um, what, information would you recommend putting into those messages? Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. But going back to the airline situation I had, I tried doing that on their website and it didn't right. work. So it's like, don't expect technology to cooperate just as in this situation where I've been dropping off. Uh, so that's one one issue that I would point out. But mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know, I'm not completely comfortable if, uh, if especially if I'm on a public Wi-Fi or if I'm on any Wi-Fi at all, whether it's public or not, I'm just a little reluctant to put a lot of personal detailed information in those chat boxes. And I, I absolutely don't want feel comfortable putting in my social security number, putting in a full account number, uh, any of that in those chat windows. So I would say that I'd be comfortable to, with it up to the point where I have to put in a full account number or a full social security number or give other personal identifying information that I don't want out in the public because I treat Wi-Fi like, uh, you know, being on the air on the local radio station. It's a radio <laughs> signal. It's out there. If somebody wants right. to come into it, they can. Um, I, I just don't have full faith, even if the website is secure. Um, I'm just not at all 100% comfortable with that. So sometimes it is better to have that conversation by phone um, or through others, through another more secured uh, system that you can feel a little bit safer about, especially when you're having that direct interaction with the, with the creditor. But this brings up another good point. Scams are out there already. And I just talked to a consumer reporter about an hour ago who said they're already starting to put warnings up about people being scammed uh, because people are calling, saying that they're your creditor and they'll spoof you on the caller ID and it'll say, you know, the name of your bank or your credit card issuer. And they're getting people to to give up their social security numbers, their account information, expiration dates, uh, the, the CV number on the back of their credit card. Uh, so if somebody calls you and starts asking for that information, 
don't assume that it's your bank. In fact, it's probably safer to assume that it's a scammer. And what you should do is hang up, report that call, and then look up the listed number for your bank or credit card company and call that back and have a discussion with a real customer service agent. Yeah, I even saw a message from the utility companies that people, they announced like we're not collecting bills or gonna mm -hmm. be shut off any services for the next two to three months for inability to pay. So now people are calling these people pretending to be the utility companies and trying to get them to pay. Yeah, the scammers are gonna take all kinds of different forms. They're gonna to try to masquerade as your utility company, your credit card issuer, your mortgage lender, your auto lender, your local government, the federal government, uh, you name it. Anybody who may have a, an assistance program for you or may have a check to send you, uh, it's just insane how many of the scams are already out there operating uh, to take advantage of people uh, who are afraid and unsure about their uh, their financial circumstances. Yeah. Okay. One last question. Who should, I mean, we can help, the NFCC is here to help people with their financial health, uh, financial well-being. How do people decide whether they should contact their creditors or if they should contact a financial counselor or if they should do both at the same time and <sighs> not at the same time? Well, you can't do it at the same time. That requires right. <laughs> you have to be a ventriloquist or something. But um, no, I would actually say that it's um, well, there's two circumstances here. If you just have one credit card company and that's all you have to call, go ahead and call them. Just pick up the phone, call them, have a discussion. If you've got multiple accounts and you're overwhelmed just by thinking about your financial situation and you need a financial professional to guide you through the process of looking at your budget, determining your resources, and understanding what programs are available through your creditors, then reach out and call a nonprofit credit counseling agency. Uh, member agencies of the NFCC are available at nfcc.org. Uh, it's a nonprofit network of, of financial professionals throughout the country. And the first budget counseling session, the initial counseling session that you receive through these agencies, uh, is, is mostly free of charge. There's no fee for getting advice and calling and talking to a financial counselor, a credit counselor with these nonprofit agencies. But if you go to nfcc.org, it's a quick way to plug in and you can find an agency near you. Uh, but under the circumstances, if you're sheltering at home and you're following the advice of the CDC, you may want to reach out to a counselor a different way. So you can call them 1-800-388-2227. Uh, it's a toll free number or you can go to nfcc.org and try it online. So a lot of different ways you can do it uh, from your laptop, from your mobile device. But I would suggest that people reach out to nonprofit credit counseling agencies because not only can they find out about the programs that may be available through their creditors, but they also get solid financial advice on how to manage their budget through a difficult time. And they get an action plan that's customized for their circumstances. So some of those things you don't get when you call your creditor. Um, yeah. So it's more of a comprehensive, holistic approach uh, to, a, to a bigger financial problem than just talking to one credit card company or one mortgage lender. Uh, so that's why I would recommend an FCC. Okay. Well, thank you, Bruce, for all of your wisdom again today. Um, we're going to be back on Friday with more time. If you have any questions in the meantime, be sure to submit them to our Ask an Expert on nftc.org. It's backslash ask dash dash and dash expert. <laughs> and I'll show it on the screen for just a second. Let me see. Yeah, it's a there we go. There it is. Maybe watching <laughs> um, and didn't understand my reading of the URL. Um, but we'll be back on Friday. Be sure to submit your questions. If you come live, you can ask your questions there. But we'll be here. We'll see you then. Yeah. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in.